Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that needs no introduction, yet we do it every show anyway. He is the infamous captain. It gets a little redundant. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. We are drinking Solar Dog IPA by the brilliant minds over at Astoria Brewing Company in beautiful Astoria, Oregon. Garage gray, three and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a wonderful IPA with a blend of citrus notes and a smooth, malty finish. Mm -hmm. And Solar Dog was brought to us by our favorite garage goers. First up, we have Chris in Ohio who says, hello from Cedar Point. And check out Kindred Beer out of Gahanna, Ohio. Of course, we've checked that out. Just one of many fine mid-Ohio beers. Like your tea. And a big shout out to Heather in Virginia Beach. Next, up top, we have Morgan in Saskatoon, Canada. Ooh, you're a Saskatoon. Next up, we have Bonita and Spud in Wallace, North Carolina. I like your jeep. And three crazy kooks from Parts Unknown, we have Heather, Claire, and Max. And last but not least, we have Haley, Sadie, and Caitlin listening in over at Murray State University. So thanks to everyone for these coldies, and if you'd like to pitch in for a round for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And for everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. We have the Team Nick shirts available, and we also have some new red V-neck logo shirts that are available for the ladies. That's all on the store page at truecrimegarage.com. All right, Captain, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Mia Zapata, 27-year-old singer for the band The Gets, was murdered on July 7th, 1993. Around 2 a.m., she had left uh, the Capitol area, Capitol Hill area of Seattle. She was visiting with a friend. She told her friend that she was going to catch a cab and head home for the night. Now, we have about an 80-minute time period where we cannot account for her whereabouts. She was found just before... 3.30 3.30 a.m. She had been murdered, brutally murdered, and the police had few leads in this case and even less evidence to go on. So unfortunately, this this case, the investigation was not very optimistic from the get-go, and it was apparent to everybody involved in this investigation, her mm-hmm. inner circle, and the music community of Seattle, that this thing was not going to be solved anytime soon or without the help of of somebody pushing this investigation along. Well, who comes to the rescue captain? Well, it's her friends and it's her close friends, her bandmates, the people that she's known since 1986 who started the band that gets with her Mm -hmm. in Ohio before moving out to Seattle to try to jump into that grunge scene and become a part of something bigger. And I don't know if this was spearheaded by Steve Moriarty the drummer for the band. Did I say that name? I probably said his name wrong and I apologize, but it seems like it was spearheaded by him. You see him a lot. There was a documentary made uh, about the gets. Mm -hmm. Um, There actually were also featured a little bit in a thing called hype. It was a documentary about the grunge scene. And I think they, they featured the gets a little bit, Mm -hmm. but Steve uh, seems like a, you know, just a stand up dude. Right. Uh, can I interject real quick? Mm-hmm. Not only a stand up dude, but like a guy that you want to have as your friend, right? Like yeah. he, he comes off to me as the type of dude that if you're buddies with him, mm-hmm. he's going to do whatever he can for you. Yeah. So they have this horrible crime. There's not much. And look, a lot of these cases, law enforcement is just a, sometimes just bumbling idiots, you know, similar to the captain. But in this case, I think they're doing their work and, but, but again, can't blame the band for not believing them. So what does the band do? They go, Hey, look, let's rally around this. Let's get the scene rallying around this investigation. And how can we do this? We need a private investigator. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do is set up uh, benefit shows where they'll play. Uh, They'll have other bands play. I believe uh, Nirvana actually played one of these benefit shows. I know Pearl Jam played one of the benefit shows. So the whole community rallies around so they could raise money uh, to put forth to give a private investigative 
team opportunity to help solve this case. And not enough, Captain, do you hear the phrase music community, Mm -hmm. right? You hear, you know, music scene or whatever, but music community, it is a community. And that's what music is all about. It's about band members coming together to create great music and bringing people in to listen and witness that great music that you've created. Now, obviously, Steve and his fellow band members, the Gits, they don't know how to solve crimes or investigate crimes. And one of their best friends was brutally murdered. Right. But what they do know how to do is they know how to bring people together. They need, and, and they did just that. You do what you know when you're faced with adversity. And they brought people together for one cause. One cause to raise money to, one, solve their friend's crime. To bring justice to her and her family and themselves. As well as, let's take this, this horrible, this a horrible monster. person yeah. did this. Okay. And this person's still walking amongst us. And if he did this once, he very well could have done it again. Let's get him behind mm-hmm. bars where he belongs. That's the difference you can make. Yeah. And I have in my notes here, Captain, I don't, I, you said a couple of bands. Uh, you said Nirvana, Pearl Jam. I have Soundgarden as well in my notes. But basically, the Gets brought these bands together to help raise a bunch of money to hire that private investigator that you spoke of. They raised about $70,000 to hire a private investigator. And they not only hired one, but they went out and they interviewed a bunch of people so they could find the best one for their case. They hired Lee Heron, and she is a private investigator. And with this $70,000, they were able to hire her for a three-year time period to work on this case. That's an extensive amount of time. Now, the thing here is she starts getting involved in this thing and she starts running in the circles that the band would have run Mm -hmm. Uh, because her suspicions were that maybe somebody, the person that did this might've known Mia. So she's talking with her friends and she's going to a lot of bars. She's interviewing band members of other bands and she gets a lead Okay, and this is through one of Mia's friends, and uh, it's a roommate of hers actually tells the private investigator Mm -hmm. that there's this person that was friends with Mia and friends with the roommate, and it sounds like there might have been some kind of relationship going on between the roommate and this quote-unquote friend, Uh, but during some heated arguments, this friend tells the roommate uh, saying things like, you know, the, the bitch is dead. The bitch Mm. is dead. Why did I do it? I don't know why I did it. Um, Just saying weird, strange things when it comes to, uh, and your mind immediately jumps to your murdered friend when you hear somebody saying that. Uh, The private investigator tracks down this person uh, and is able to collect a lot of samples. Uh, She searched the the vehicle, uh, searched his car. Uh, She would eventually turn him into law enforcement. Uh, believing that she had a good suspect. Now, law enforcement, they use the polygraph test to talk with this individual. Mm-hmm. Now, and it, we we touched upon it a little bit, but when you have this situation with very little evidence, the polygraph test might be your number one weapon when you're talking to these suspects because you have to figure out who had the means to kill her during that 80-minute time period. Where were they? Were they involved? Are they lying about where they are? Right. Uh, now, this individual, even though he's saying these strange things, um, he passes the polygraph. Mm. Uh, so, unfortunately, this lead doesn't seem to pan out. Well, then you start questioning why is he saying these strange things, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, but This comes from the captain who says strange <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, I, I put it, put that on the T for you. Every week I leave the garage and I go, why does he say these strange <laughs> things? <laughs> That's what I say every week about myself. Now, the private investigator, she's going to get another lead. And this lead is actually generated through a fan of the Gits. Uh, this fan started some type of internet relationship with a guy that lived in the Seattle area. Now, this guy, he starts saying strange things while we're on the topic, right? Mm -hmm. He starts talking about how he is going to do to this girl what he did to Mia. Uh, So our Mm -hmm. private investigator uh, starts following this guy around. And what she observes is that this guy has some strange hobby. Okay. This is, you know, every episode we get into some dude that's got a strange hobby. This is a strange hobby. Let me guess. It's podcasting. 
Uh, not that strange. Okay. No, uh, no, this is this is horrible, um, and it makes your mind wander. Mm. Okay, so while she's following this guy, this is something she figures out that he has he does on several occasions. He parks at schools. Oh God! And he watches girls' soccer teams from his car. He stays in his vehicle the whole time, and then after the soccer game, or well, they called a match, I guess, or the practice, whatever he's watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, afterwards, he would drive to a porn shop. Okay, so this is definitely strange behavior. The private investigator she collects a whole bunch of information on this guy. And she ends up figuring out that at let's one- just rewind for a second. Sorry. So <laughs> he watches girls play soccer. Yes. And then he drives to a porn shop. Yes. That's his hobby. Well, I'm guessing it's his hobby because the private investigator, Lee Heron, she said that she observed him do this on more than one occasion. Mm. So it's not like it just happened on accident once. Right. Okay, so, um, and she's probably only following him for a limited amount of time. Who knows how often uh, he spends his afternoons this way. Regardless, the private investigator, she collects info on this guy. And through this information, and after studying this guy for a while, she Mm -hmm. learns that he did know Mia at some point. It's questionable. I'm a little unclear as to what their relationship was, if they were just acquaintances or if it was more than that. But she definitely points out that they had known one another. Well, and this case is very difficult, too, because, you know, even if you're an introvert, mm-hmm. right, even if you kind of keep to yourself, it's like you know of a lot of people when you're in a band and a lot of people know of you. And so there'd be a lot of people that I've played um, gigs with, you know, our band open for theirs or theirs open for our for my band or whatever. Mm-hmm. That, that I've probably hung out with, you know, 10, 15 times. But other than those circles of people, I've never hung out with them ever. You might not even know their last name or where they live. Right. Uh, they're exactly just acquaintances. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but get this. There's a little bit of icing on this bad cake here, right? Um, I don't think that's icing. Um, he's, he's a cab driver. Oh, uh, And she, Mia, remember, said that she would probably get in a cab and head home for the night the last time that she was seen. Yeah. Now, when confronted by the private investigator, um, he says that he's not in, he was not in the area the night that Mia was killed, that he was off. He was out of town. He was staying with a friend in Olympia. Okay. Okay. Well, this is a very good private investigator. You don't just straight up lie to a private investigator of this level because she figured out very quickly Mm -mm. you were not staying with your friend in Olympia that night. Uh, So he's unable to account for his whereabouts uh, for the night that Mia uh, was killed. Okay. So, so he just basically came up with a false alibi Mm -hmm. and then the alibi didn't check out. Right. He, he does eventually break down uh, to, to the private investigator. He admits that he was driving his cab in the Seattle area that night. Right. Um, he explains to her that he has a severe drug problem and it's one, it's, it's hard for him to account for his whereabouts a lot of the time. Um, but he says, you know, I had nothing to do with her death. Well, and possibly the reason why he was lying in the first place is that he's probably heard rumors that she was catching a cab. Yeah. Right. And so then he knows he was driving a cab in that area that night. Yeah, you know, there, there's a part of me that feels for him. I mean, he is a creepo that watches girls soccer and then goes to porn shops. But, uh, yeah, I, I guess I feel for him in the sense that he has a serious drug problem that he can't yeah. seem to get a hold of. Um, I don't feel for him because his, his movements seem very strange to me and seem like maybe something he might want to talk to a professional about that. Oh, he's definitely. got some, some things to work out uh, even past the drug problem. Yeah. He should try talkspace.com. There you go. Um, but so this, this is a very good suspect. This is a very good suspect in this case. Yeah, I think so. But again, like I was saying, like you, you've heard the story. So it's, and you are a cab driver. So, we have that speculation that she got into a cab, but on the other side of things, if you are innocent, then man, you, you know, the story, like I said, and so you're going to go, well, they're going to assume it's me. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if I tell them I was in the area and I was working that night, they're going to assume it's me. Well, and he's got a couple of other problems here too, because with that severe drug problem, who knows if he, you know, like we said, he's unable to account for his whereabouts. Maybe he's even unable to account for what he does when his eyes are open. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he, maybe he blacks out the other thing too. He's probably running in certain circles and doing certain activities, meaning purchasing and using drugs where he's often breaking the law. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons, too, that the band did such a good job as far as raising money and raising awareness and keeping this on the forefront because they were afraid that law enforcement just looked at, you know, Mia as just, you know, here's some grungy girl, um, you know, that possibly was a drug addict as well. I mean, there was no signs of uh, drugs in her system. Right. Be, we got to should be clear about that. Right. But, but the idea is that, I mean, think about it this way. I mean, it's, you know, I grew up. You know, especially with my parents, you go, I'm in, and I'm in a band, and they just assume that all your buddies in the band are drug <laughs> addicts, right? You know, uh, so this this individual, uh, all the information that Lee Heron collects on him is turned over to law enforcement. Now, law enforcement agrees with the private investigator and says that you know what, this is a very good suspect, mm-hmm. and you know, we're going to look into this. Um, there's not, they are never able to link him to the murder of Mia Zapata. And like we said before, though, I mean, our biggest weapon here, our biggest ally here is a lie detector. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been able to find any information if they, if they were able to question this suspect. Right. The statements that I saw, um, didn't, didn't include anything, whether he took a polygraph or submitted himself to a polygraph or not. One thing we we should think about, though, too, is if somebody is unable to account for their whereabouts or somebody that's blacking out often, Mm -hmm. you might get a lot of answers that are, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I did. I don't know. And they're not lying. They're not lying. So the polygraph may not help you in this situation. But the police's statement was basically, um, we had nothing to link this individual to the actual murder. Well, again, with the private investigator, it's the same as law enforcement. Law enforcement was frustrated because every time they got a piece of evidence, it kind of went nowhere. Mm -hmm. When they got a lead, it went nowhere. And that's the same thing happening now with the private investigator. And the ban would not stop. Right, right. And because uh, there was a lot going on with the band and what they were, tra- their efforts that they were trying to pull together at the same time that this private investigator has unleashed her investigation and she's following these people around. Uh, some of that is in 1995, uh, the Gits collaborated with Joan Jett. Yeah. Uh, they made an album and they did a tour to benefit the private investigation further of Mia Zapata's murder. Uh, they, they named the band Evil Stig. Um, which I'm a little unclear on this, Captain. You might know better than me, but it obviously spells gets live or gets live backwards. Gets I, live, yeah. Gets live. And um, Joan Jett did a, um, she did something, she she wrote a song about a woman being attacked on the streets, uh, which was kind of, you know, based off of what she knew about Mia Zapata's case. Well, I, I know that uh, Seven Year Bitch wrote a song called M.I.A., which was, I think, loosely based on the actual uh, murder of Mia Zapata. And that record, I believe, was called Viva uh, Zapata. Yes. And a lot of people would, you know, at these benefit shows would yell Viva Zapata. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're also, what another thing that was super weird about this was Mia wrote a song. Yeah. Uh, you know, before her death and and it was talking about her being attacked by a a serial killer, which I mean, now we know like talking heads, right? You know, psycho killer, Mm -hmm. kiss, kiss, see. Uh, so, you know, I, and, and it's a dark subject, but I think there's a lot of bands that have drawn, uh, on this, on the true crime topic for, for songs. Well, I believe that song was called the sign of the crab or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, you got to keep in mind, you know, she's in Seattle at the time of, the green river killer investigations going on. Um, and that was something that did not stay out of the news hardly at all. Um, you know, so this would have been something that anybody with their ear to the ground would have been aware of, which I mean, think about the, her bandmates though, that recorded on that song and now going through what they've gone through 
and having to listen to those lyrics and, and how, uh, you know, almost like a fortune teller um, Mia was to her own life. Mm -hmm. Now, we said that the band raised over $70,000 to hire this private investigator for a three-year time period. Um, eventually, the funds did dry up. Uh, there were no major breaks in the case during this time, mm -hmm. but the investigator, Lee Heron, uh, she continued to investigate on her own time afterward for many years. Now, it was in 1998, um, after five years of investigation, the Seattle police, uh, their detectives basically came out and said, unfortunately, we are no closer to solving this case than we were right after the murder. And so much time has passed in that in this case, but the band, like like I said, I mean, I just championed them, Steve and, and all the guys in the gets, and everybody that helped them out as well. But they they didn't just raise money and awareness for uh, this case; they also raised money for like self defense classes. Yeah, they called the organization. It was a self defense group called Home Alive, and you know the name obviously coming from wishing Mia would have got home alive that night mm -hmm. and how could young women and girls fend off, uh, these type of attacks. So, uh, they would have taught self-defense. Uh, they also taught martial arts and, uh, use of pepper spray so they could defend themselves while they're out on the streets and make it home alive. Well, and the band could have just sat on their thumbs and did nothing, but they didn't. Right. Like we said, they raised a bunch of money. They got a private investigator involved. They, they, started this group for self-defense classes but you know it's nine years into this case you know as every year goes past you got to start thinking like people are losing hope at this point oh by yeah incredible incredibly i mean this it's gotten colder and colder and colder as the years have gone by not only did the police investigation go cold the private investigators run out of leads uh nine years later and we're not looking at any type of way of solving this Except for one thing. we Remember, we talked about the police and the investigators doing their due diligence. Well, they were able to collect some DNA. That tiny little minuscule amount of DNA that they collected. And they had the foresight to save that DNA. Right. Rather than to push in the chips and risk it and potentially destroy the DNA and never solve Mia's case. Right. But as time elapses, we have new technology. Yes. There's advancements going on in DNA evidence and what they can do with that. And a lot of this comes about by a way of a guy named Kerry Mullis. Uh, he wins the Nobel prize for, uh, chemistry, uh, in the nineties. And he developed, um, something called polymerase chain reaction. Uh, we'll, we're just going to call it PCR. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to keep repeating that. Um, why don't you tell us what PCR is, Captain? Well, <laughs> you see how I just bowed uh, out gracefully great. on that one. <laughs> Again, I am a captain, not a scientist. You, you know, this advanced science stuff gives me a, a migraine headache. It was well, again. There, there's a lot of little documentaries, and one of the things on this case that, that I thought was interesting was the forensic files, and they kind of break this down a little bit better than probably I will. But basically, what they are able to do is it's almost a photocopier for DNA. So they're able to take the small sample and duplicate it. Now by the duplication, we have enough to sample, but we also have enough to, uh, if, if the test doesn't go right, that we might be able to sample again or photocopy it again. Now this, um, the Nobel peace or Nobel peace prize, the Nobel prize was won in 1993, the same year as her death. Okay. The reason why they waited so long was because PCR wasn't, uh, perfected yet and there was still there was some trials and errors and so with such a small sample they could have tried the PCR and it could have not worked and then again damage this DNA we'll get right back to the breakthrough in this case after this quick beer break All right, cheers, mates. So we have a break in the case. Yes, and just like a lot of the investigators believed early in this case, when all the leads dried up, they believed that without any DNA, 
that this case would probably never be solved. Well, and you have to applaud law enforcement for not losing this evidence. Yes, not losing it and not risking it by testing it too soon until the technology had fully developed. Thank God Fami Malik was not involved in this case. <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's the way that this goes down, Captain. Um, it takes quite a bit of time, as we had said, but uh, in 2001... They are able to amplify the DNA that they found on Mia Zapata. Now, mm -hmm. this was from the saliva that was collected near the bite marks that were on her chest. And it's going to have two strands of DNA. So, yeah. so there's the DNA, but what it's stating is that one strand is Mia Zapata's strand and the other strand is of a male. Yes. The 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 worry that, that they faced when they went into this, that it might have just been Mia's DNA and Correct. that they wouldn't be able to extract anything else. What they end up finding is hers along with its single source male DNA. Mm -hmm. They enter this into the system. Um, and this is in 2001 and it failed to generate any positive results matching it to uh, a suspect. But this uh, system has a name, right? Uh, yes. So this would be the CODIS system that we've talked about several times on, on the show. So, but, but this is to break it down simply, uh, CODIS is where if you commit a felony, then they collect your DNA and it goes into this system. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens here is that in 2002, there is a man arrested in Florida on the other side of the United States mm -hmm. uh, for burglary and domestic abuse charges uh, in 2002. They collect his DNA during this time. Uh, this man is Jesus Mesquia. And he is a man that had a history of violence toward women, uh, including domestic abuse, uh, burglary, as we have mentioned, s assault and battery as well. Mm -hmm. Now, all of his ex-girlfriends and his wife uh, had filed reports against him at some point in their relationships. Um, here's the thing, Captain. Mm -hmm. Now we have King County investigators are going to have to go to Florida and and try to find Jesus Mesquia. He, he commits his crime. His DNA is in the system. But they have to keep testing. They keep have to keep running the test mm -hmm. to find a match within mm -hmm. the system. So somebody kept doing their job. Yes. And so now the now law enforcement is going down and they're going to try to capture this monster. Right. And you know what? Let's give credit where credit is due. You said somebody had to keep running those tests. Somebody had to keep this DNA evidence and store it. Uh, the person responsible for that, her name is Jody Sass, um, and she was she worked at the Washington State Crime Lab. Well, Jody Sass, I like your jib. There you go. Now, Captain, you know that these things are never as easy as they appear to be, right? You can't mm -hmm. just you can't just go marching up to somebody's door, knock three times, they open up the door, greet you with a smile, and you go, "Guess what, sir? We have your DNA on this murder victim. Here's your handcuffs. Put them on, and let's go to jail forever." Right. It never works that way. I wish that it did. But the uh, King County investigators have to go to Florida to try to locate uh, Jesus Mesquia, and they have to they they need to apprehend him. But they're going to have to question him first. It's not just as simple as arresting him because they found his DNA. They go to his home where he and his wife were living. Um, I don't know if this Jesus guy is just really lucky, you know, to get away with murder for this many years. Um, and then he gets lucky again because they learned from talking to his wife that he left the home just days before they arrived. Um, and I don't think that it had anything to, I don't think they put it out an announcement that they were going looking for this dude. Right. So he leaves, uh, the wife has nothing but bad things to say about this guy. And she's going to give them every bit of information that she has so they can apprehend him. Well, yeah. Cause he's probably, you know beat her for years. So she provides them with a very good description of his vehicle. You know, what kind of car he's driving, make a model year, all that good stuff. Probably even the license plate number as mm -hmm. well. Um, they're going to put out this information to all their blue blood brothers, uh, throughout the state of Florida. And they're looking for this guy. They're looking for his vehicle. Well, his vehicle is spotted a few days later in Miami. Um, and that's when the investigators are going to go to Miami and knock on his door where he's staying. They interview Jesus 
it there sound it sounds to me I I was they didn't videotape the interview I wasn't able to witness it right but from the way that the investigators described the interview there might have been a bit of a language barrier between uh, the investigators and Jesus now yeah now he was in the country for a long time but he was an illegal immigrant yes and he was from uh, from Cuba mm-hmm. so they're talking with him and he's saying you know I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I, you know, I didn't murder anybody. I've never murdered anybody. Um, also claims that he was never in Seattle, I believe as well. That's exactly right. Now the investigators do something pretty interesting here. Uh, and they basically provide Jesus with a photo lineup. Well, it's a photo lineup of unfortunately a bunch of dead young women, Mm -hmm. uh, murder victims. And they're pointing to each one and they're saying, you know, do you know her? Have you ever seen her? Have you talked to her? Have you dated her? Mm -hmm. Uh, All these questions about every single one of these pictures of these girls. And Jesus is saying, I don't know any of them. Answers no to every question that they have, Mm -hmm. including all the questions that they ask him about the picture of Mia Zapata. And so what the detectives are able to take from his statement is he's saying, I've never met her. I've never spoken to her. I didn't know her. Well, guess what? You just, they just laid a trap right there because gotcha. gotcha. Because guess what? If you didn't know her, you've never spoken to her. You've never met her. Then why is your saliva on her? And why was it placed there shortly before she died? Now, now do you think the cops confronted him right then when he said no? Um, I believe he was arrested very quickly after that statement. Right, but I mean, but they didn't like say, hey, this is how we got you. Right. Because if I was the detective in the room, I would have said, you done messed up, A.A. Ron. (laughs) Well, they're going to continue to build their case against Jesus. Mm -hmm. And one thing that comes about pretty quickly after they arrest him is they're going to put his picture on the news and in the newspapers because they're happy that they finally made an arrest in Mia Zapata's case. Well, there's a woman that comes forward. And she had actually filed a police report weeks before the murder. And this police report was because some man had exposed himself to her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she says, you know what? Remember that report that I filed back in 1993? That was the guy. Yeah. That that was was free Willie. Yeah. That was the guy that exposed himself to me. Well, he's got all kinds of problems now. Jesus does. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not only did he leave his DNA evidence on the murder victim, um, but now the prosecution has a living witness to to testify against this guy, saying that he was in the area. Uh, mm-hmm. This is what he was up to. Um, he could have done the same thing to to Mia, uh, mm-hmm. but they were also to est- able to establish that he was in the area, living just yeah. like blocks away from where her body was found. Yeah, that they were able to establish that he lived about three blocks from where her body was found. The other interesting thing here. And I don't think they were able to prove it, but I always wondered if maybe he worked for a taxi company. Yeah, I think there was some rumor about that. It's a little hard to trace him um, to to pinpoint on a right. day to day basis where this guy was. He was a drifter for he, most of his adult life. One who's illegal. Yeah, and he lived in. Uh, they know that he lived in Florida, Arizona, and Washington, and and it was a bit of a brief stay. Uh, Mm -hmm. in Washington, I believe, but he had some kind of small criminal history in both the state of Florida and Arizona. Well, he had a criminal history, I think in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why they, they basically sent him here. Yeah. And let's not get into that conversation because that's a whole, that's a whole nother conversation. It's political. Um, but the thing here, this, have you seen this guy on TV? He's a large man. It's kind of scary. Like he he he's got like a football player type build to him where I mean like he's tall, big shoulders, long arms. Mm-hmm. Uh and that was the thing that her bandmates and the private investigator said when they saw him on TV and saw that he was arrested. They thought, you know, really unfortunately Mia didn't stand much of a chance against this guy. Right. Um, and they believe that the way that this thing went down is that she, she when she left her friend's apartment around 2 a.m., they think that Jesus would have spotted her probably within about 15 minutes of leaving there. Mm-hmm. Then he followed her for a bit of time. 
Uh, she's wearing the headphones, most likely wearing the headphones, like you had said. And she may not have even heard him creep up behind her mm-hmm. and grab her and attack her. Uh, unfortunately, you know, not only a murder victim, but the last hour of her life must have been hell. Um, and this guy is is an is a monster. I know we. Yeah. Th- I feel like that word is overused on our show a little bit, um, but that's all I see when I look at this guy. It seems like this case obviously was sexually motivated. That's mm-hmm. his motivation here. Uh, you know, we also have the fact that he is, you know, flashing himself. I wonder too if he was like a peeping tom. Uh, but th- there's no doubt in my mind that he has done this before. Before Mia, he did it after, and I'm sure that there's other cases that this guy is connected to. Yeah, I was really hoping that his, you know, once he was arrested and then convicted, he was convicted in 2004, um, and, he, you know, he convicted of first-degree murder, meaning that they they fully agree and are aware that he abducted her and mm-hmm. and assaulted her and then killed her, knowing what he was doing the entire time. I was hoping that with his picture being in the papers and being on the news, that somebody just like that lady came out from 1993. I was hoping more people would come out and maybe be able to solve some cold cases. Cause like you said, captain, I, I throw him into the bin of once a monster, always a monster. Mm -hmm. Um, the unfortunate thing, you know, I, thank God this case was solved. That's all you can hope for when these horrible things happen. When people, I shouldn't say when horrible things happen, it makes it sound like it just happens. No, right. when people, when horrible people go out and do horrible things to good people, mm-hmm. that's all you can hope for. Um, but it was a little, it bothered me a little bit. And I'm not going to lie to you that he, he only received 36 years um, for that's for abduction, s- assault and murder. Um, it seemed a little light. I do take, I do take some, um, they weren't able to charge him with, uh, the rape as well, or is that included in the assault charges? Uh, it may be included in the assault charges. I'm a little unclear on that. Uh, the only thing that I, the only thing that I can be somewhat happy about is I have in my notes here that he was 48 years old at the time of his, I don't know if that's at the time of his arrest or his conviction, but regardless, he would be in his late forties, maybe 50 years old by the time he was convicted. I'm hoping that with a 36 year, uh, prison sentence that this guy never sees the light of day again. Well, you know, he had to go back to trial, right? Yes. So this is what drove me nuts is, you know, 36 years doesn't seem like enough, you know, especially for somebody's life. But so he goes back to trial because they said, well, that, that penalty is too harsh. Mm-hmm. not have a new trial, but we're going to, you know, re- resentence, you. resentence you. Yeah. And he waived his rights. Okay. Which made almost zero sense because that's the reason why they're having the resentencing trial. Anyways, he ra- waived his rights to have a jury that forced it back onto the judge. And mm-hmm. guess what the judge did? Ball or move right here. Just resentenced them to 36 years. Okay, very good. Um, I have that he never testified on his own behalf, but he has maintained his innocence in this crime. Obviously, we have proof positive that he is not innocent of this crime. And I think we all could learn something from her bandmates, her friends, her family, the band that gets. We can learn something of don't give up, keep talking about the case, keep trying to shed some light on the case, and then maybe we can get some justice. Yeah, and once again, the gits were made up of Mia Zapata, Andrew Kessler, Steve Moriarty, and Matt Dresner. And if you get a chance, make sure you check out the work of Mia Zapata and the band The Gets. How about a little recommended reading for you, Captain? Yes, Colonel. All right, so we have received, and thankful, we're very thankful for this, we've received a lot of praise for our episodes last week. We did the Killing Fields trilogy. Um, that took a lot of research to put that baby together. And I uh, wanted to mention that, you know, give credit where credit's due. And a lot of that research came from the Houston Chronicle, uh, the newspaper down there, as well as Catherine Casey's book called Deliver Us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're looking to learn more about the Texas killing fields and more about the, the cases within that case, uh, you need to check out Catherine Casey's book, Deliver Us. And you can do that by going to our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. 
And you can pick up any of the books that we've recommended there or DVDs that we've recommended there simply by clicking on the Amazon banner and your little purchase costs you nothing extra, helps out the show. Thanks to everybody for joining us in the garage this week. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Litter.